Steve, if he would, read verses 10 through 17 so I can save my voice as much as possible. If you would, read uh, Amos 7, verses 10 through 17. Okay, what you have here is you have Amaziah, the priest of Baal, basically telling Amos, go home. We don't want you preaching here anymore. What we find in chapter 7, we saw the uh, vision of locusts, verses 1 through 3. Amos intercedes and God spares the people. In verses 4 through 6, you have the vision of fire. Amos intercedes and uh, God spares the people. Then in verses 7 through 9, uh, Amos sees a plumb line. God has a measuring device, a plumb line, and he is measuring the people. And verse 9 is the reason why Amaziah spoke up. Verse 9, oh, look at verse 8 and 9. Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. Now, We see here that God is measuring his people. That's the vision that you have here. That's the point of the vision, the point of the plumb line. Verses 7 and 8. People are not meeting God's standard. They have deviated from God's will just as a wall can deviate from what it's supposed to be in its vertical position. And when you measure it with that plumb line, you see that it's not in line with what it should be. And therefore, he's measuring them and saying, you're not what you should be. And as a result of that, he says, these high places of Isaac shall be made desolate. Those are the idolatrous high places where they would worship idols. The sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. These were Israel's sanctuaries that they set up, not God. Remember Dan and Bethel. That's where they set up the idolatrous worships. These were their sacred spots, not God's. He says, these sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. You see here in chapter 1 that it was during the time of Jeroboam. There in chapter 1 and verse 1 that Amos is prophesying. In the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So you have a a, a wicked king. You have a false religion being established. They are worshiping these false gods. These are God's people doing this. They're acting like the nations round about them. And God is measuring them and saying, you do not meet with my standard. Therefore, I am going to destroy you. And so that was a message that they didn't go up to Amos and say, thank you, Amos, for stepping on our toes. Thank you so much for pointing out our error, and we're going to straighten up now. We're going to repent because you offended us, and that's exactly what we needed to hear. No. Amaziah, verse 10, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to hear his words. The land there representing the people. It's not literally talking about the land, but it's talking about the people. The people, they don't want to hear this message. And Amos was from what direction? Was he from the south or from the north? Where did Amos originate from? The south. Amos was from the south, Tekoa. He went up north to preach to Israel, the ten tribes. And he's up there from the south preaching to the northern ten tribes. And he is preaching against them. He says, I will rise up against the house or the family of Jeroboam with the sword, verse 9. And here you have Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. Now, is this a priest of God? No. This is a priest of the priesthood that Jeroboam set up, of the common people. 
Now, he's called a priest, but he's not a priest according to God. And so he's saying, look, this message is, is harsh. He's speaking against the king, and we, we don't want to hear it. The land is not able to uh, bear his words. And look at verse 11. For Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. Israel shall go into exile and uh, away from this land. So the people got the message. They got exactly the message that Amos was getting across. Jeroboam's going to die, and the people are going to be taken into exile. The reason is because of their sins, they will not straighten up. They will not come back to me. Therefore, they're going to be punished. Look at verse 12. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the temple of the kingdom. Here you have Amaziah, this false priest. He's not a priest of God, but he is a priest of idolatry. He says to Amos, go seer. Now, why is Amos called a seer? He's a prophet. But what specifically is the, the meaning of seer? Sees the future. But not only that. He sees visions concerning the... Uh, he's seeing visions here in chapter 7 and in chapter 8 concerning like God measuring the people, uh, things of the past as well. They're in earlier in chapter 7. So it's not only seeing visions of the future, which is true, but he's seeing visions of the present and seeing visions of the past. He's a seer. He sees. God gives him prophetic visions. So here you have Amaziah saying to Amos, you go seer, go to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy. What does it mean, eat bread there? Does it not mean make your living down there? Eat bread. You make your living as a prophet. You go down there, you, make your, you go prophesy down there where they want to hear you. Make your living down there. Eating bread as a prophet was referring to the prophets who ate bread. They were supported in their prophetic ministry. And he's saying there, you go down there, we don't want you here. You go down there and you prophesy. You make your living down there. And prophesy there. Verse 13, but never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary and it is the temple of the kingdom. So here you see uh, Amaziah, the priest, saying, Your message is not what we want to hear. Go away. Go home. I see a parallel to what we have today in, in the church. Do we not see that? Preachers who preach the, church, pre preach the truth and they say, here's what the Bible says on any particular subject. And the elders say, go home. Go away. Do you know that message that Steve preached this morning in some churches of Christ would not be tolerated? Because they want to compromise with the world. They want to compromise with evolution. They don't want anyone to, anyone to make a definitive stand because it will offend their friends and their colleagues. So Steve's message would not, get a, would not be received, well received among some churches of Christ and in a lot of denominations. But that's, that's what we face. And so they say, go home, go away. We don't want to hear that anymore. Don't tell us we're wrong for believing in evolution. Don't tell us we're wrong for, for accommodating uh, the worldly theories. We, we want to be open. We want to be broad in our thinking. And so they say, go home. And that's exactly what Amaziah is saying to Amos. We don't want to hear you preaching and telling us that we're wrong. I've known of so many preachers who have lost their preaching job because they preach against uh, immodesty. They'll preach against unscriptural divorce and remarriage. They'll preach against dressing immodestly and dancing at a prom. They'll preach against going and involving themselves in social drinking. 
And they lost their job because the congregation and the elders said, go home. You're making us feel bad. You're making us feel guilty. Go home. And so that's what you have here. It's, 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 he's telling them the truth. He's telling them exactly what God told them to tell them, but they don't want to hear it. Notice his response. Here is the, the famous verse from Amos. Amos uh, 7 verse 14. Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, a son of a prophet. But I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock. And the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Here Amos is saying, look, I'm just a common everyday Joe. I'm just a common everyday man. I was working in the, as a herdsman and a dresser of the sycamore figs. He's a country man, country boy we'd call him. He's not a professional prophet. God called him to be a prophet. And he says, I'm not a prophet nor a son of a prophet. What's the significance of saying that? That I'm not a son of a prophet. I guess it's only, he tells us that he has nothing to prove. That's, that's, that's a good point. He has nothing to prove in the sense of <clears throat> the only credentials he has is my message is from God. Uh, that, that he is not, uh, he's not your ordinary uh, career prophet. You did have career prophets that were prophets of God who prophesied over a period of years. I think Isaiah, Jeremiah, you would call them career prophets. He was just an ordinary man in an ordinary situation, God called him to be a prophet to go give a message to um, to Israel. Steve, you had something. He's basically, that's, that's a good point. Verse 14, he's saying that I'm just a common person. I don't have the, the background as, of other prophets. Now, I want you to consider this. The phrase, sons of the prophets, appears 11 times in the Old Testament. The first time it's found is in 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse 35, where a man is called the son, one of the sons of the prophets. And here's what one commentator said concerning this. The son of the prophets. The expression occurs in 1 Kings 20 and verse 35 for the first time. It signifies the schools or colleges of prophets which existed in several places in Israel. These were young men who were regularly educated for the prophetic office. These schools make their first appearance under Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 20. The sons of the prophets. You'll find this expression 11 times in the Old Testament. These were schools for prophets. They would be equivalent to the modern day schools of preaching. Except they had direct messages from God. We have a written message from God that we study and learn from. So there was an actual school or teaching college or or, or in a school in some sort in which the prophets learned from one another. Amos is saying, I don't have that education. I don't have that background in the schools of the prophet. I'm just an ordinary man. I was no prophet. He wasn't a prophet before this, nor am I a son of the prophet. So a son of the prophets, as you find that expression throughout the Old Testament, starting in 1 Kings 20 and verse 35, is a reference to a group of prophets that came together, they studied together, and they involved themselves in the prophetic office. It is believed that this school was started by Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 20. So Amos is saying, look, I I don't have this background. I was just an ordinary herdsman of a dresser of the sycamore figs. But the Lord told me, 
and took me, uh, took me from the follow, following the flock. And the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. God said, go preach. And that's what I'm doing. So we see here that what matters to God is not your background. What matters to God is your willingness to go and preach. Your willingness to be obedient to his word and go and preach. We're told to preach the word. The New Testament says, if any man speak, let him speak of the or- as the oracles of God. So we speak as preachers, we speak as Bible teachers, not because we have some sort of education and a background, but because God has spoken to us in his word and has told us to go speak. And that's what Amos is saying here. I'm not a professional, he's saying. And verse 14 says, The Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go and prophesy to my people Israel. It's amazing the preachers that are preaching today, that are are preaching the truth, that are standing for what's right, you go back and look at their background. What did they used to do before that? Some of them were electricians. Some of them were plumbers. Some of them were ordinary people, mechanics. But they decided to give their life to gospel preaching. And that's basically what you see here. Look at verse 16 and 17. God told me to say this, now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Israel and Isaac are used interchangeably here. Isaac is referring, of course, to God's people Israel. Here's what he says to them in verse 16. You don't prophesy, you tell you to, you're telling me not to prophesy against Israel, don't preach. Against the nation, well, here's what you need to hear. Verse 17, therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a prostitute in the city. Your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided up with a measuring line. And you yourself shall die in an unclean land. And Israel shall, go, shall surely go into exile away from the land. Here you see the courage of Amos. Amos is saying to him, look, this is what's going to happen. You tell me not to prophesy, but I've got to. I've got to say what God told me. And here it is. Here's the message to you. Your wife's going to become a prostitute in the city. Most likely the reason why that's going to happen is because of the financial difficulty that was going to come upon Israel. Usually women who go into prostitution do so because they're in desperate need of money. And so there's uh, what's going to happen to your wife. She's going to become a prostitute. Your sons and your daughters, they're going to die by the sword. They're going to be killed. Your land that you live in, Amaziah, is going to be divided up with a measuring line. And you're going to die in an unclean land. In other words, you're going to go into exile. You're not going to die in God's land. You're going to die in a Gentile land, an unclean land. And Israel shall surely go into exile, exile away from its land. So here's what you see, this message being, being spoken uh, to the people and being spoken to Amaziah, saying, this is what you need to hear. <coughs> it's not what they wanted to hear, but it's exactly what they need to hear. Now, we're not going to go into chapter 8 because I just don't have the voice for it. But I do want to look at a, a, a passage that I think is apl- uh, applies to us today. 2 Timothy chapter 4. As we consider the work of the prophets were to preach the word. Preach the word when they liked it. Preach the word when they didn't like it. Preach it when it's popular. Preach it when it's not popular. You preach the word. And what you have there in the book of Amos is very similar. And we're going to see this in the book of Jeremiah where Jeremiah was up against the false prophet Hananiah, and all the people wanted to listen to Hananiah the false prophet because he was telling things that people liked to hear. And here Jeremiah is coming to Judah saying, look, you're going into 70 years of exile. Hananiah said, nah, it's not going to happen. Look, we got the temple. Everything's great. We got the temple, and if we do go into exile, it'll be two years tops. 
People wanted to hear Hananiah because that message was appealing to them. Jeremiah was persecuted because they didn't like his message, but it was the truth. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time is coming when the people will not endure sound doctrine. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers, the ESV says, to suit their own passions. And will turn away their ears from listening to the truth and will listen to fables. Verse 4. What do you do, Timothy, when that happens? Do you bend with every whim and fancy of everybody and every doctrine that comes along? Do you be like a reed shaken in the wind? Verse 4 or verse 5. As for you, you always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. He already told them, told him, that you preach the word, you be ready in season and out of season. You preach it when they want to hear it, and you preach it when they don't want to hear it. It's very interesting when Jesus was talking about John the Baptist. He was talking to the people about John. He said, what did you go out in the wilderness to hear? A reed shaken by the wind? Did you go out in the wilderness to, to, to see someone in fine clothing? He said, people wear fine clothing. They're in king's palaces. What did you go out to hear when you went to listen to John the Baptist? He was very much like Amos, unprofessional. But he told Israel the truth. What they needed to do was repent. They had to turn away from their sins. They had to be baptized under the baptism that he was commissioned to give. And as a result, many people did believe and obey. And Jesus said, what did you expect to go hear? A wind shake, a reed shaken by the wind? Just a reed, just blown any which way the wind blows it. No, he was a rock-solid man of God, just like Amos was. And that's what we've got to be as individual Christians and as a church. No matter how the wind blows, no matter what's popular, no matter how many people compromise, whether it be with evolution or denominationalism or liberalism or all the the bells and whistles that the denominational world puts forth. One thing I have in mind is like instrumental music, the big trend towards instrumental music in so many churches of Christ. But the interesting thing is there are denominations now that are giving up instruments. And they're going back towards a cappella. They're going back towards the thing that we've been doing all along. Because it's pure. And yet some of our brethren want to go back and be like the denominations. How ironic. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's the kind of things that you have. And, and that's just like being like the world, you know, door prizes and let, let's, uh, let's get them in, in, in the door however way we, whatever way we can. If we have to, uh, you know, gamble, we have to have door prizes, that's what they'll do. Just compromise with the world. That's about it for my voice. Thank you very much.